Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Larikia, and it's the 7th of September, 2022, as I record this intro. And it's compilation time again. This week on the podcast, I'm sharing one of our listener favorites from 2019, a collection of conversations with grown unschoolers in which they offer their thoughts for newer unschooling parents. I woven together answers from 11 episodes featuring 12 grown unschoolers. I think you'll find their answers helpful and enlightening wherever you are on your unschooling journey. And if you want to dig in deeper, there's a link in the show notes for all the episodes in the Growing Up Unschooling podcast series. I also want to share a comment on my blog I got last week from Sarah on my A Positive Outlook Isn't Turning a Blind Eye post. She wrote, I realize this is nearly a decade old, but wanted to share that it really resonated with me at this time in my life. Events coming up soon are largely out of my control, and I've been feeling that fear circle in my head, obsessing over every possible outcome. This was a great reminder to slow down and just take it one step at a time. I don't have to have everything figured out right this second, and there's room for adjustments to the steps I do make. Love reading through your blog. It's been very helpful to me in my unschooling journey with my eight-year-old and with myself too. (laughs) So lovely. Thank you, Sarah. For a few years, I wrote and published pretty much weekly on my blog, and that whole archive is still available on my website. I wrote about my thoughts and experiences around unschooling rather than current events, so it continues to be helpful for anyone navigating their unschooling journey. And a couple of years ago, I created an archive page with links to all the posts organized by theme. I had a monthly theme. That sounds like me, right? (laughs) So it's easy to find particular posts and to navigate the archive in general. I'll put a link in the show notes, or you can just go to my website, livingjoyfully.ca, and click on blog in the menu. Now, before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. And a big welcome... Welcome to new patrons, Sina Ross Kiergaard, I hope I got that reasonably close, and Divya. Welcome, Sina. Welcome, Divya. (laughs) I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Your generous support is instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now please enjoy this compilation episode of grown unschoolers sharing their thoughts and advice for newer unschooling parents. Hi everyone. I'm really excited to share this compilation episode with you. In most of my conversations with grown unschoolers, I ask them what advice they'd like to share with newer unschooling parents who are starting out on their journey. In this episode, I've woven together uh, answers from 11 episodes and 12 grown unschoolers. It's so interesting to hear the things that they feel were valuable for them as they grew up unschooling. I think you'll find their answers fascinating and great fodder for you as you contemplate your family's unschooling journey. So to get us started, Idzi Damare was the very first grown unschooler I interviewed back in episode 12. She went to kindergarten for a few months, but soon she was home. Their relaxed homeschooling style naturally transitioned to unschooling over the years. So here's what she shared for parents starting out on their unschooling journey. As someone who's grown up unschooling, is there a piece of advice you could share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on this journey? Oh, I guess I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'd probably want to go back to what we were talking about earlier about how, uh, uh, you know, learning is in the fun to, to maybe stop, stop being so attached to looking for learning and to just focus on paying attention to what's actually happening to the joy, to the, 
the exploration to the struggle to whatever it is just pay attention to what's happening instead of trying to assign learning to things or create sort of artificial learning moments um mm -hmm. to just focus on on you know on yourself and your kids and your lives and just try and uh, share a, a rich life together and that's where the the learning really happens that's beautiful. Yep, that's exactly it. <laughs> oh. It's hard though, isn't it? You know, when it you is. first start because because you're still so worried about, you know, childhood is so inextricably linked to learning in society's mm -hmm. mind, right? So that's a that's a huge piece for them to give up. It but, is. And I think even even years later, like there can be moments of doubt and moments of is this right and moments where you kind of want to grab on to, to things that look traditionally educational and productive. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's saying that you never completely stop fearing, but just to be moving in that direction of letting go of these sort of expectations. Mm -hmm. And looking and looking at your kids, right? Very much so. Or yourself. Yeah. It works just as well when it comes to looking at yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah, as long as you've cleared that luggage away and you aren't judging yourself. <laughs> yes, yes, oh, for sure. But that's what I mean, giving yourself the same, look at what you're actually yeah. doing, what's actually happening instead of having these unfair expectations of yourself or of your children. Oh, yeah, that's a great point, great point. Thank you very much, Itzy. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great reminder to release expectations about what you think should be happening and pay attention to what is actually happening. When you're fully in the moment with your kids, that's where the unschooling thrives, where fun and learning flows. Now let's hear from Roya Dado. Roya is the oldest of three siblings and left school at age 10 when her mom suggested she not go back to school for fifth grade. Here's her advice for newer unschooling parents. As a grown unschooler, what piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on this journey? I would say for unschooling parents who are just starting out, just to relax, just completely relax. And if you need to give yourself a time limit of how long to relax, give it six months, relax for six months. Um, just let go of anything you think is important. It's not you know, and I'm talking about brushing your teeth, eating a nutritious, balanced, you know, diet about going to sleep at certain times, any, anything, just relax. Nothing irreparable will happen in six months. Just relax. Um, and then the next piece of that is don't let anything, nothing is as important as the relationship that you have with your kid. Nothing, no piece of information, no degree earned, no job, nothing is as important as your relationship with your kid. So when you are struggling with something or trying to make a decision about something or decide how to react to something, I would be thinking, which option connects me more to them? Which option, in, you know, improves our relationship as opposed to which option gets them in bed or which option gets them to brush their teeth or, you know, think about their relationship first is what I would say. I love that piece about relaxing because you know what, when it, it, you've made this momentous decision either to not send your kids to school or, you know, to bring them home and it just seems so big. It seems like you need to, to do something, to do something, you know, the, that, that, uh, so much of their life hinges on this one decision, but truly to be able to relax and just let life flow for, as you said, at least six months, six months to a year, that is is uh, so important because all of a sudden you learn so much more about your child, especially when, as you said, if you um, if you need something to guide you, the relationship that's the perfect place, right? Just as you have ideas, it's which one is going to help the relationship versus you know push us further apart. That's uh, that's really cool because that's one of the hardest things is to realize. Okay, we made this huge decision. Now we can just like relax and have fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's hard. It's it's a quite a dichotomy to walk that seriousness versus <laughs> just the levity of it. And I know my mom talks about, and she might have said this on your podcast. I honestly didn't listen to that one. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's hard to listen sometimes to stories about me. But um, she she tells at conferences that her guidance when she first started was 
to she was trying always to light our eyes up that you know that that light of like oh that's interesting or oh I like that or whatever that thing is that gets that little uh, spark in your eyes she said that was what she was going for so whatever if she offered something and we were eh about it then she would drop it and she'd try to find the things that made us interested and that was kind of her pet project when she was uh, first starting out as an unschooling mom and I like that I, I like that a lot because I, I think it goes you know it's relax and, and the other side to that is have fun you know if, if you need something then think of this as a vacation and do all the things that you would you know do just to have fun when I when I talk to parents and I say really like when your kid is 80 what do you want for them in their life it's happiness. You know, it's, it's, it's not for them to know every single math equation in the world. It's not for them to have memorized history facts or or even to be very much exposed to these things. The reason they want them to get those things is because they think that will lead to success and that will lead to happiness. But when you go all the way to the end of that road, it's happiness. And so why do you have to wait? So, you know, be thinking creatively about other paths to that and then in therapy, you know, we, we talk about why you think math problems is, you know, the thing, but, um, but it's, it's all, it goes back to, you know, you can't, you can't force happiness. Happiness doesn't happen when you're desperate or when you're scared. So relax. I know. Well, and that's the other piece, you know, the best learning to see your kids, um, you know, when you take them out of school, it's like, oh my gosh, if they're not doing, you know, workbooks or worksheets or whatever, that's the point is having fun, right? When they're having fun, their eyes light up and they're learning like crazy. And there's so much science that backs, you know, if really what it is, is you want your kid to learn things, all of the science in the world backs that we learn things when we're having fun. You know, it's yep. like if you just want to look at it from that perspective, then do that. I love how Roy's answer echoes what Itzy shared. Completely relaxing is about releasing expectations and seeing what happens when everyone is free to make choices and have fun. Find the things that make their eyes light up. Now, let's hear from Brenna McBroom. Brenna went to public school for first grade, and then they moved to traditional homeschooling. When she was 12, they went to their first unschooling conference, felt like they'd found their people, and made the leap. Here's what she shared. As a grown unschooler, what piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on this journey? Yeah, sure thing. Well, so I feel like I'm not a parent at this point, so I, you know, don't have firsthand experience or perspective on that. But as a grown unschooler, um, I think (laughs) the way that I mostly interact with kids these days is they come into my booth when I'm selling stuff at a craft show. And um, most of these kids aren't unschooled. uh, And something that I see a lot is parents just being very, very controlling of their kids. Like put that down, don't touch this, you know, back away. Um, or, you know, things not even related to like what's going on in the booth. Just, just a lot of pretty controlling behavior. And, and I will just say that I've never had a child break something in my booth, but I have had several adults (laughs) break things that when they come in my booth, kids come in and they're usually very, very careful, um, because they're, you know, their parents are often, are often kind of, um, complaining at them about it. Um, and so I think the, the piece of advice that I have is that if you can work on relaxing your need to control things, even a little bit, it helps to move you in the right direction of unschooling and it helps to improve the relationship that you have with your child. Because I think that that's the big difference I see is that sometimes parents come in and, um, you know, I, I see this good relationship between them and their children and, Um, And I see them really working with their children rather than trying to control them. Yeah, that is such a fascinating point because, you know, um, as you're saying, you don't you haven't had kids break things. I imagine um, parents jump in with control because they don't think their kids know. But kids are really. can definitely be attuned to what's going on around them. And when we jump in and control, we kind of, we take that power away from them, don't we? Because if, if they, um, they would be going in and, and being careful on their own, but we snatch that from them when we 
when we tell them that they have to do this and they have to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 99% of the kids who come in already are, they're already being careful, but then they're getting this negative feedback from their parents as though they're misbehaving or doing something wrong. And sometimes it's kids who are quite old, kids who are, you know, 11 or 12 or 13, who certainly, you know, already have the self-control and, uh, you know, maturity Mm -hmm. to to be able to come in and and interact with me as an adult kind of yeah and when you look at it from their perspective being told that when they're already doing that it's like don't they they don't i imagine it um they don't feel seen because it's like well can't you tell i'm already doing that Yeah. (laughs) yeah yeah for sure absolutely yeah, that's that's really cool because that is uh, a great first step. It, and one of the things that um, when parents are coming to unschooling, um, to be able to open up and and start to release some of that control and start to see their kids for what they're actually doing, that's that's a huge uh, piece of, of de-schooling. So that's very, very cool. Oh, thanks. thanks. I love that insight from Brenna. Starting to release some of that need to control and at the same time paying attention to what your kids are actually doing is a big part of de-schooling. Do you see a beautiful pattern weaving through Idzi's, Roya's, and Brenna's answers? They are encouraging us to shift our lens away from expectations and fears to what's actually happening in the moment. The next clip is from episode 181 with Jack and Sean O'Brien. They grew up unschooling with Jack choosing to go to high school. So here's their answer. I would love to know what piece of advice um, each of you would like to share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on this journey. What would you say to them? Um, The first thing that comes to mind is trust your kids. Um, Trust that they will find something. Um, I mean, it it only took me to... So I was like 14 to really like find like to really start picking up speed and, and start finding things that I, I liked. But like for Sean, it, it took longer and, but yeah, he's on a path now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was 16 by the time I even went to NPC. And right. That wasn't high school. Right. It was right. just one class. Yeah. Um, so really, really do trust uh, that they will find something. And then also like, like see what they're doing and try to like find the value, find the value in what they're already doing, because there's probably, they might've already found it. And you just don't think that it's, you might not seeing that it's like, it's valuable. Like this goes back to the video games, you know, like, right. Like even at the age of, you know, we were kids and I was like eight and you know, we're 12 or something. And, and we were playing video games. We were already starting to find it. You know, I was, I was like, getting in these online games and like, you know, talking to my teammates and like, let's rally guys, like working with these, these total strangers to like complete this goal. Um, and that was me like finding it. That was me like slowly realizing, like, I want to like, I want to work with people. I want to help people like work well. Um, and then similarly with Sean, like he was always more interested. He was always interested in, in the cool games with the beautiful art and yeah. like the really, really more interesting stories. And like, it just shows. So when we were like really young, we were already starting to find it. So if you can like, as parents, if you can like really, really pay attention to what they, what like gets them excited, chances are, even when they're kids, that probably will, that, that's some indication of, of kind of who they're going to become. Yeah, and there's like, something there Yeah, when you're just playing video games just doing whatever sitting mm-hmm. around and it looks like to a lot yeah. of parents you're doing absolutely nothing significant and they're like oh no my kid is failing they're mm-hmm. not interested they don't want to go to school it's like you're there's something there they're, they're, everyone has interests yeah i think we're just drawn to find them regardless of what we're doing whether or not we're in school or not yeah is there anything else you would like to to add to that sean what would you say well, something else uh, that we were talking about before is don't um, don't give up on it. I think unschooling is the type of thing that works really well if you're able to go through the whole process where you start unschooling, you let your kid do their stuff, figure it out for themselves, and then go and have the motivation to do something themselves. If partway through that, um, you tell your kid, you know, someone gets worried that their kid isn't is not working or whatever. And they send their kid off to school. I think you lose a big part of the benefit of it, which is that the self-motivation, the fact that you're choosing to do something, the kid loses that because now they're being forced to go to school. Um, 
And, and now almost it maybe makes it worse. And I mean, we didn't have this happen. So I, I'm just sort of spitballing. I'm just guessing on mm-hmm. what it might be like, but it feels like now you've had this, this breath of fresh air where you can kind of do what you want. And then suddenly you're in school where everything is structured and you have to do certain stuff and it's not your choice. It's going to feel really bad to have all of that relaxing personal stuff taken away from you. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It feels uh, like that would be, that would feel like that time was judged and that you failed at it somehow because now your parents have decided to take that choice away from you when it's not, like you said, not on your timeline. Right. So it can be a double whammy. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And then, I, and then it also, it, if you're not, if you don't have that motivation, the, the transition to the formal education can be hard. I mean, we, it was the, you know, like taking tests and stuff, and stuff right. was easy for us. Cause we were like, oh yeah, let's do it. But if all of a sudden you're now you're in, you know, eighth grade or something and you didn't want to be, it could probably, it could feel really overwhelming to all of a sudden have all these tests and all this stuff. If you weren't like expecting it and ready to like take it on a challenge. Yeah, so definitely stick it out. If you, if, if at all possible, stick it out, give your kids as much time as they, as they need because they'll find something. I love their focus on trusting your child to find their path. It won't likely be on your timetable, but it will happen. Next, we hear from Katie Patterson. Katie grew up on schooling, leaving school after kindergarten. Here's her advice for parents starting out. As mm-hmm. a grown unschooler, what piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on this journey? It involves a lot of listening, listening to your child, listening to yourself and figuring out, okay, like, like we talked before, figuring out what are our limits and what, and it's like, is this my discomfort or is this my child's discomfort? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of listening. And also learning to let go and learning to like let your child explore on their own. If they need help, they'll come to you for help. Um, you don't have to helicopter mom or helicopter dad if you're if you're an unschooling dad. Um, that understand that they they can figure it out. And if they need help, they'll come to you. And the second thing I say, I say this in seriousness as well as not so seriousness. The TV is not an evil entity. Do not fear the talking box. It is not going to eat you in your sleep. (laughs) Um, Because a fun fact about me um, and why I bring it up and because it ties, it does tie into like me as a person and me and my career and stuff like that. I didn't really talk until I was nearly four. Like when I say didn't really talk, I mean, I don't mean I'm talking like this where I'm speaking full on sentences. I'm speaking spontaneously of like how I feel and stuff like that. What I did was I would watch movies and if a line um, brought forth a certain emotion and later in the day, if I felt that certain emotion again, I would repeat that same line that, um, that I had had the same emotion because that's how I connected it. And uh, sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. And I was very great. I'm very grateful because my parents, like it could, they could have very easily been like, no, don't do that. That's weird. That's, that's not a normal thing. Instead, we turned it into a game that we played at dinner where we would quote movies and we'd have to guess what movie we were quoting to, um, and, and we would just like play for hours. Like we would have dinner and then we're like, okay, it's time to play movie quotes. Let's, what do we, what do we got? Who's got the first quote? Who can, who can out quote, who can out quote everybody else? I won a lot of the times, because it was really good. <laughs> but at the same time, because of that, I was able to develop the memorization that I learned at that very young age, like about three and a half, nearly four. And it learned into like my memorization of scripts as an actor and memorization of emotions and, and like learning how to like push di- different buttons to like bring forth the motion organically. Or as my, um, one of my acting teachers told me living truthfully in imaginary circumstances. And that thing that could have been seen as a defect, that could have been seen as a great fault ultimately turned into what I am now where I'm able, I make a career out of memorization and, and attaching it to emotion. Oh, I love that story, Katie. Thank you very much for sharing that because 
that's the thing we were talking about before too, right? Be mm-hmm. open to our kids and seeing our kids, um, you know, through their eyes instead of through our lens, you know, mm-hmm. and like you were talking about that judgment of this is, this is weird. This is something wrong. This is something yeah. we need to fix, but it's, it's not normal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Embracing the child for who they are, because like you said, you don't know. And, and it doesn't need to be that it turned into a career, but yeah. it's something it's that just, that's just what happened. That's just what happened. And yeah. we were open the possibility that this is some that something that could have been turned into a detriment turned out to be one of my great strengths. Yeah. And it's actually something I'm still really good with. I'm really good with memorizing stuff. Like I tell, I always tell my mom, I'm like, mom, you said this about last week. Did I? Yeah, mom. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You know, no matter what, if there's something they're interested in or something, some way that they're seeing things or whatever, We don't need in that moment to understand why. It may be 10, 15 years looking back where we go, I see what they were getting out of it. I see the value, the whatever, the connection, you know, and we don't even have to know ever, but what's important is it's really important to them in that moment, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that's how they're engaging with the world. And another thing I'll probably, I'll close out on this one because I don't know how much time we have left. Um, when it has like, like I had with like my memorization stuff at it, don't look at it as like, this is a big detriment. This is a big fault. This is a red flag that this is bad. This, this is wrong. This is not normal. Embrace it as a trait that this is who they are. This is what makes them a person. They may grow out of it. They may um, develop it into something else. They may, it may stick with them. Who knows? Um, but really embrace that. Don't think of it of like, oh no, there's something wrong. It's like, okay, this is what my kid is dealing with. We're going to deal with this. We're going to figure out if it, if sh- if the kid needs help, or if I just let it be, or if I help develop it into something else. That's something that's good. Don't always think in negatives. Try to make it a positive. Yeah, and and that's all part of um, just supporting them, being with them. Because you know what? If at some point they are starting to feel like it's a negative and they want more help, absolutely. The movie quote game is a great story, isn't it? And a wonderful example of embracing who your child is. It started way back when Katie was a toddler, supporting her strengths, and is woven beautifully into the person she is today. Next up is Kelly Nicole. Kelly left public school for greener pastures at the end of fifth grade, and her family eventually settled into unschooling. Here's what she had to say. Now, as a grown unschooler, what piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on this journey? Gosh, don't do it. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Turn it back now. Don't. (laughs) Drop them off at the orphanage. No, no. Um... (laughs) Um, guess what I've said the whole time is kids are people, Yeah. um, embrace them for who they are. They're not going to love everything you do and you're not going to love everything they do. And that's okay. They're going to be into things you didn't care about and you're going to try and get into things that you cared about and they don't like it. And that's okay. Just love your kids for who they are. And that's like the most important, I think anyone unschooling or not, you know, I Mm -hmm. see a lot of people who, who don't have that and don't do that, but Kids are tiny people. Just your job as a parent isn't to do things perfect. It's to help them grow and learn. It's to support them. It's to lead them into a, a healthy life path. Um, and that's all you can do because eventually your kids are going to grow up and they're going to go out on their own. So if you're unschooling, at least you have that time with them to make that difference. Yeah. I love how that message has, has, you know, come through in so many of the questions in all our conversations, because that's what it comes <laughs> down to, right? You know, yeah. we're, we're and that's people a huge in a relationship. Yeah. And that's what made a huge difference for me in my life. That was a wonderful reminder from Kelly to embrace your children for who they are. Did you notice how beautifully it connected with Katie's answer? And now let's hear from Alec Trossett. Alec left school in the third grade, and over the next couple of years, his family made their way to unschooling. Here's what he shared. 
The last question I would love to ask you, as a grown unschooler now, uh, what piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on the journey? This is a, that's a hard question. So, um, <laughs> but of course, uh, let's see. Um, so honestly, the best thing that my parents did for me was give me the freedom to make my own decisions kind of a universal freedom to make my own decisions, you know, within reason. But, um, you know, when it, is, when it came to what I put in my body, what I spent my time doing, when I slept, I was given the freedom to do all of those things. And it allowed me to make some poor decisions at times and learn from that and and eventually become the, the healthy person that I am now who, you know, I really feel like the self-awareness I've gained from that. The fact that I know my body so well, I know my interests so well, I know myself so well, I think that's what it comes from, is the, that universal freedom I was given by my parents. So, you know, it's hard to let go, but it helped me so much. It was, you know, it, it's, it, it helped me in so many ways, but I know that letting go is the hardest thing to do as a parent, probably. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that piece. And um I, I love that you threw in there that within reason thing and, and the, I was going to say poor choices, but they, they weren't poor at the time. They were the choices. No, I've made poor choices. <laughs> I made poor choices. Are you kidding? Is it a good idea to, is but, it a good you know, idea to drink a gallon of Kool-Aid a day? I don't know. <laughs> but it would taste really good. And then, you know, I didn't feel so great. And then like, oh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try more water and, you know, and now at 25, I'm drinking nothing but water and everybody around me has got their diet Coke or whatever. And not everybody, but yeah, the, yeah. you know, the rates of drinking very unhealthy things is way up. And, and I got that out of my system and learned what that does to me on my own terms and, and have been able to establish uh, healthy habits for myself. So mm -hmm. just, um, just by, yeah. I know it's paradoxical, isn't it? It seems like yeah. um, having, having the, the freedom, freedom to drink terrible things. No, I don't want to. So, and I feel like having it, if I had had it restricted from age, you know, zero all the way up to 18 or 19 or whatever, when I, I was an adult, mm -hmm. it would be much harder to form healthy habits because I want to be healthy. Um, because the, the only thing stopping me from drinking before would have been this restriction. Well, if you're, if you're avoiding something because of restriction, then it's not for yourself. Um, you have to learn to do something like that for yourself. Um, and, and that's what I was able to do from a very young age. Now, and the, the within reason, of course, I'm not saying you've got a five-year-old kid and you have sugar, sugary snacks laying all over the house and they're eating nothing but that. And, and there's, there's common yeah, sense I, stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah. well, I think uh, the within reason bit is, is the conversations that unschooling parents see. Conversations, was, yes. Is, you know, sometimes when mm -hmm. parents, un, new to unschooling parents here, give our kids freedom, they disconnect. They think of it as, yeah, okay, just right. leave them alone to make yeah. their choices. And no, the, the reason, within reason part is it, but it's within the child's reason, but it's, it's having conversations with them. It's helping them process those choices. Oh, gee, you know what happened after that? Oh, maybe, maybe that stomach ache is related to all that Kool-Aid or, you know, yeah. just helping them learn from it, not leaving them to try and figure it all out in the dark. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that is, uh, you, you brought it up, but the, the other thing I would have said if I, if I had thought of it myself first was, is definitely the communication. Um, unschooling is not unparenting. They're unrelated. There's no connection between the two. And um, my parents also always communicated to me and wanted to make sure I knew that, yes, those unhealthy things I was doing were unhealthy and they wanted to make sure I knew that while I was doing it. But I still had the choice and that's what allowed me to choose not to do that anymore for myself so well yeah because you know when someone's telling you when they take away that agency when they take away that choice then then your choices aren't about you anymore you know what I mean like um you know if if they were judgmental in you know they were sharing information about oh you might not be feeling well because of x choice right 
But if you could tell through their tone that they were trying to control you, your choice would be more in reaction to their kind of judgment than would be to you actually learning, gaining that self-awareness yeah. and making that choice for yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. Right. I love Alex's insight into the value of having both the freedom to make choices and open communication with his parents. Choices and communication, they weave together brilliantly, don't they? Now, notice how the freedom to make choices comes up again with our next grown unschooler, Max Vernoy. Max always unschooled. When he hit school age, his parents asked him if he'd like to go, and he said, nope. <laughs> Here's his advice for parents starting out. As a grown unschooler now, with years of unschooling under your belt, what piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are just kind of starting out on this journey? Maybe they've got young kids or maybe their kids are a little bit older, but they're just discovered it. They're just diving into it. What advice would you give to them? I think giving your kids the choice, the, the option to make choices in their own life is a huge benefit to them, including allowing your kids to make the wrong decision. Because I think making the wrong decision can be a huge benefit to growing your character and to learn about yourself. And I think a lot of parents get too caught up forcing their kids to make the right decisions that their kids don't even learn how to make decisions. I, I think there's that. a big difference between you can still be there as a parent to help guide your child. You can give them advice, give them feedback, help them through whatever decision they make, and then be there to catch them if they do fall down, but let them make that decision for themselves, I think is a huge benefit. Yeah, I think parents can get be so caught up, like from the way we were raised and, and most of us went to school, failure, in quotes, is such a big thing, right? To avoid. It's like, oh my God. And so we want to try and save everybody we know. I mean, our kids, our spouse, you know, everybody. It's like, no, no, I, I know what's right. That's not going to work out, right? But it's so true. That's something I learned um, from watching my kids. Um, and, and I used to just be so amazed. Like they, they'd make a choice. They'd want to do it. And it wouldn't work out the way that they were hoping. And mm -hmm. it wasn't the end of the world. Like I'd be totally, you know, in shame and embarrassed and judging myself for having made the wrong choice in that moment because I didn't get what I wanted out of it. But no, they, they, they just learned from it. And there's, they just like got right back up and like, oh, hey, oh, oops, that didn't work. I'm going to try this. So try this. And I think that was something that I learned um, from my kids so much and how valuable it was to just be able to make the choice. Because, I mean, you're always making the the best choice for yourself in that moment, right? I mean, you're not thinking, oh, well, this would be, I this thing has the best chance of working out, but I'm going to choose something different. Typically, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, what do you learn? You learn, oh, I was missing this piece of information or I didn't understand how big that impact was going to be. Like there's a million things. And like you said, you learn so much from it. And having your parents around to help you just process that, figure out what it is that didn't work out as, as you expected, et cetera. There's just so much learning, again, about ourselves and about the situation and about how to make choices, right? Oh, I didn't consider this or I didn't mm -hmm. consider that. There's just... So much in there. I love that. <laughs> now, is there anything else from your unschooling experience that I didn't ask you about that you think would be helpful for people trying to understand? Like, I know so often they enjoy um, hearing from grown unschoolers, right? Because they, they're choosing this lifestyle, but you know, their, their kids are younger and they don't, they don't know how it's going to turn out. And I think that's something that they really enjoy. So was there another piece of your unschooling lifestyle over the years growing up that you thought was really important for you? I think just being respected makes a big difference. If you want to, if you want to, uh, if you want to raise a kid and, 
to be respectful. Respecting them is the best way to do it. That makes sense too, right? It's not when you think about it. Because it it sounds often, obvious when you think about when it. When you think, I know, right? <laughs> it seems obvious, but so we we grew grow up being taught that you know you just automat you respect your parents like automatically. That's just something that parents should expect of their children rather than earning it, right? Mm-hmm. And and by showing that respect to them and treating them as a as a as a real person, as a human being, that's what helps them understand what that means. You know what I mean? Like Yeah. Yeah. It's it it's almost so self evident it's hard to explain. <laughs> Yeah. Again, thinking about it, it's kind of obvious, but in every single little moment, it's hard to think and remember to be kind and respectful with everything you do because life is hard. Mm -hmm. Life is full of various things that you have to deal with, especially as a parent raising children. There's a million things you have to worry about. And sometimes being respectful to your kid is not one of those things that you think about, unfortunately. I love how Max brought being respectful to your child into the picture. And how even though life can be hard, taking that time to respectfully engage with them through those moments can be so valuable, cultivating both trust and respect for each other. Now let's hear from Alyssa Patterson. Alyssa grew up unschooling, choosing to go to high school for a year and a half or so before returning home again. Here's what she shared. So as a grown unschooler, What piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on this journey? Um, welcome. Um, it like you, I honestly, and I'm not one to like blow smoke or anything like that, but I just think it's one of, it's one of the greatest things that people that we are lucky to actually be able to do. Um, you know, there are some, like some States where it's a little bit more frowned upon and depending on where you are, obviously, Um, but I think my advice would be, um, just because I've seen it and I've had friends that go through it is, um, make sure when you are raising your kids, cause it's a way of raising your children, um, that you are not putting your fears and insecurities onto them. Um, and by that it's not, it's more of like, I've seen people be like, oh, they're not they're, they're not going to be not, they're not, and I've never heard anyone say it, but it, they've implied it. It's not, it's not hard to miss that they're not going to get to ask to prom or they're not going to get asked to, or they're not going to be popular or they're not going to have all these things. And you have to, as an adult, I think you have to acknowledge that those are your fears. They don't know those things. They don't. And so I think it's our job when they're little to protect them from those things. And, um, being popular isn't that great sometimes. And, you know, there's a lot of negative things about, I didn't even, I went to high school. I didn't even get asked to prom. No one asked me. So there's not just because of that, but I think those are yours. And like we were talking earlier about, they are their own individual person, whether, you know, whether they're, it's a boy, it's a girl, transgender, whatever. They are their own individuals. And so you have to accept that you have yours and they're going to have theirs. And I use this analogy with my mom. She was having, she asks me questions every once in a while when she has people, she's like, I don't know how to respond about this preteen situation. I was like, you have to think about this. I said, social media, like I said earlier, has taken off in a way that they're constantly accessible, that they are, it's, it's crazy how much access people have to each other now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's it's insane. And so you have to think about it, this, especially preteens, because I feel like I'm noticing a lot of people pulling their kids out of school, um, at 10 or 12. And they're really, I've talked to people that are really struggling with it just because their 12 year olds don't think they're going to make any friends or anything like that. You have to be very patient and understanding because they are, they are literally, the way that I put it with my mom is I was like, they are literally going to war every single day with their own mental, if they have their own insecurities that they're beating themselves up on or anything. And they have people literally throwing darts at them all day long because they have so much access. And so they are in a battlefield essentially. 
And I said, the last thing that they need is their parents throwing darts from the back. Oh. And, and they're, it's very sad, but it's very true. And the thing is, is they're not even mean, malicious things that we're like doing, but I think you have to take a step back and acknowledge maybe they don't want to be popular. Maybe they don't want to go and be social. Maybe they don't want to go to prom. Maybe, you know, their sexuality is different or anything. And I think it's very big to let help them and a lot of people are like it's my job to keep them on the right path or the good path and I completely agree that it's your job to keep them safe and everything like that but it is your job to keep them on their path because their path is the good path for them and so it's your job to help them on their path and just because their path may twist and wind a little bit differently than yours it's theirs and so you have to just be really understanding and supportive and I think really listen to them because I feel like, especially in the system, I feel like a lot of kids weren't listened to when they would say things. And um, I've seen a lot of people go down some really, really dark paths and some people not make it out because they weren't listened to. And so, um, which is really hard and no one should have to go through that. And so um, I think it's very important to listen and I feel like a lot of people, I've seen tons of quotes about it, is a lot of people listen. So um, what is it? They listen to react and um, not to understand. Mm-hmm. Or it's listen to respond instead of understand. And I think that speaks volume, especially when you're in a transition like this, because it is a very, people think it'll be easy. Like, who doesn't want to just stay home all day? It's very hard it's very hard for your kids. And I, th- I, mean, I know it's hard for the parents too, because some of the kids get rebellious and they get, have attitude and they've got hormones going on and they have all these other things. But I think that's where the compassion needs to come in. You need to be more understanding, more listening, and especially in the transition, do what they want to do. It's not, why fight them? Like if you're trying to do something and create them and help them build and stuff like that, help them and listen and talk about it and really weigh in their opinions because they have a say it's their life. My goodness, Alyssa, that was, <laughs> that was wonderful. I love that. And that is such a huge challenging part of the de-schooling process. I think it's that unwinding of that. Yeah. That view of what we, what we imagine our children or who we imagine our children to be versus who our child is. Right. Exactly. I mean, I think that it starts with you. I think it starts with the parent. Like you have to recognize your views yeah. versus their views. And, and that once you do that, is so important, right? Yeah. And once you do that, I think you will have, it's going to be shocking how much, what kind of doors will open just from acknowledging your fears, your projection that you're projecting on your kid. And, um, they may not be scared or they may not, you know, they might not be ready or maybe don't pull them out right away and do unschooling. Unschooling is not for everyone. Like I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's not if, and sometimes I've had, I have one girl that was just so in school and she was so into it. And I said, why don't you just go to a one day Academy? Why don't you baby step and help them? Don't just shell shock them you know, and listen, if this is something they really want and they're really passionate about, then you need to compromise. Cause like I said, it is their life. Exactly. Well, and it is their life. That's that, that is the entire point you're trying with unschooling. We're trying to give them that power to be fully engaged in their life, to be making those choices right. and learning from them and discovering, discovering themselves and what they like and, and how they like to learn and their personality. Like, all that kind of stuff, we want to help them do it now versus waiting till they're out of school, they're out on their own. All of a sudden, there's like all these other responsibilities in the world while they're trying to figure themselves out at the same time because this is the first time they've ever been on their own. Like, I mean, I remember that first year of university and people, the other the other kid, I mean, it was crazy how 
unprepared they were to just be on their own because they've never had that or experienced that or made their own choices before. Right. Um, right. So it was like, it was like, you know, that rubber band that you pull and they just boom. Off. <laughs> they off. They're like slingshot out into the world. Yeah, exactly. But no, I mean that, that was spectacular. I had goosebumps listening, Alyssa, because uh, that, that is such, such a, a huge aspect, but entirely worth it. That, that is going to be, I think one of the most important parts, right? Because once you can right. See your kid and as the individual they are and be listening to them and be working with them to accomplish what they want versus what we would like for them. Because sometimes, especially when we're first getting started, we can't tell the difference between those things. Like you said, you think it should be so easy for us to all be home, right? To leave school or to not go to school. And we have all this time. We can just do all the fun things we wanted to do. But who knows, like, were those fun things that I think we should do because that's what, you know, families like to do. Oh, families, of course, we should want to travel. And of course, we should always want to go out and go to parks and, you know, do these do these extracurricular classes and all this kind of stuff. Right. This dream that we have in our mind about what it's going to look like if we don't have school in the picture can be very different from what our kids actually want to do. So us teasing that that out for ourselves. Um, understanding what are our expectations, understanding what we've just absorbed as what we should be doing, you know, and then discovering who our child is. So often I say, you know, spend those first few months just hanging out with your kids and discovering who they are and what they like to do. And they're going to be doing that too, right? When they, when, especially if you're, it's a shift in your lifestyle, if you're having a big change coming from school or even coming from a more conventional mindset, right? Yeah. That, that they too are going to have so much adjusting to do from on the academic side, maybe, but also on that parenting side and that shift to exploring and that shift to being able to express themselves you know when they're asked what they want to do like oh my god it, it's yes well I think that's a big thing too is that a lot of people don't um I'm glad you said that that um a question I feel like a lot of people parents don't ask is what do you want to do yeah and they say this is what we're going to do and there's a huge difference and you're going to see a huge difference just by changing those words because when you make them believe that they actually have a say, it's shake, it's shell shocking to them in that. And so they are just like, Oh my gosh, like I can actually say like, I want to sleep till two. Okay. Like that's okay. It's okay to sleep till two. And I see lots of people arguing about that. It's okay. (laughs) I slept till two for a long time. And, um, I think it's a big deal when you start asking them, what do they want to do? And I think that's a huge first step in unschooling is because it's about them. And so what, what do you want to do? Alyssa nailed the value of doing the work to be able to recognize and acknowledge our own fears so we can avoid projecting them onto our children. Remember to ask them what they want to do and then help them do that. This next clip is from my conversation with Adrian Peace Williams. Adrian grew up unschooling and chose to go to high school when she was 15. She shared some great insights about that experience in our conversation, but here are her thoughts for newer unschooling parents. As a grown unschooler, what piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are maybe just starting out on this journey? Yeah. I thought about this question and it's tricky because I think every parent and every kid and every community and every environment is different. So it's going to look different for everyone. But I, I think what I came to was like the things that I have valued, I think the most from my experiences being unschooled was that um, was like my tools kind of that I have now I, that I think being an unschooler got me and the parents that I have was like, okay, how do I listen and how do I communicate my needs and how do I listen to other people's needs and how do I know how to ask questions when I don't know the answers and, 
And how do I go into a new situation feeling okay and feeling like, okay, I can do this. And even if I don't know how to do it, I know what my next steps are or how to figure it out or, okay, this didn't work. Where do I go from here? And how to like, how to live and how to, how to love too, like how to love myself and how to love other people and how to, you know, figure my way around a city and like how to take care of other kids or like how to have a conversation with an adult when I'm three (laughs) (laughs) or like, I think knowing how to learn is much more important than knowing math or like knowing how to write an essay perfectly because if you know how to learn then you can go into most any situation and figure it out and know how to have the confidence that that's okay like like teach your kid that it's okay to not know something it's okay to you know be wrong or like make mistakes and it's okay to do these things and that's those are the situations where you learn because if you know how to learn and if you know how to fail then like you can do anything I think (laughs) because if it's okay to keep failing eventually you're gonna get it and you're gonna learn and 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 how to yeah love and like work in a team and and listen listen I think to your kids because I think they'll tell you what they need even if it's not verbally I think that yeah, letting them be the leaders, I think, is really important, too. Yeah, focusing on, like, skills instead of specific things and then just following your kid, I think, are important. That's such a great point, isn't it? If you know how to learn and you know how to fail, you can do anything. It's okay to make mistakes. That's often something that as parents, we need to work through because growing up, making mistakes wasn't okay. It meant a big red X, a lower grade, and feeling bad about ourselves. That work is de-schooling in action. And our last snippet comes from my conversation with Xander McSwan. Xander left school in the fifth grade when his mom, an education professor looking at studies on human learning and child brain development, decided the best thing they could do for their kids would be to pull them out of school. Here's what he shared. As a grown unschooler, what piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on this journey? Hmm. Mm. <laughs> I know we talked we yeah. talked earlier about the cocoon phase, if that happens. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think that is such a big piece to... Um, I think it's probably the, the biggest learning curve mm-hmm. is um, having heard from sort of uh, like our, our sort of cultural paradigm that as a parent, you're uh, sort of like so responsible um, for your kid to to be OK. Yeah. And if they aren't like um, behaving in a way like a kid and out on TV behaves, then you're a failure as a parent. Um, and I think that um, a really big part of unschooling is sort of slowing down and learning to really trust in your kid and in the relationship you have with your kid and to let uh, let that kid blossom in exactly the way that they want to and that they're meant to. And I think the, the most powerful thing any parent can do for a kid, in my opinion, is to... Um, be there to sort of stand as this like smiling supportive witness um and watch the kid grow into their perfect expression of who they want to be in the world um and that can be that can be really hard to do as a parent that's a huge (laughs) question like a huge request to make um and i think there's like i haven't uh, heard research or stories that have led me to think there's anything else that comes close to having as much impact in a kid finding happiness and, um, and meaningful engagement in their life. Yeah. I love that. I, I love that word witness, witness rather than direct. Right. Yeah. I really love that's, that's a, that's a great way to put it, um, to be there and, and that positive trusting, 
um, supportive, uh, just just. So I guess supportive, supportive is it, you know, witness to their lives and, and encouragement um, uh, yeah. and acceptance of who they are. Right. That that totally. that's that huge piece, you know, when you especially when you come from school with school, there's this, you know, model that everybody's supposed to get to. Right. Yeah. Doing doing well and listening well and doing what you're told and, and, and everything. But to help them to give them the space and time and support to find out who they are. Yeah. Right. That's, that was great. One, one of the projects I work on now is, um, I volunteer in, in prisons, mm-hmm. um, helping, uh, helping inmates to sort of get to know themselves and, um, come into a greater sense of sort of like emotional understanding and, um, a really huge part of what we're doing there is, um, giving this human um, a space to express themselves and be accepted and sort of like learn to trust that they're safe in that room and that they're loved and belong um, and that they deserve those things sort of no matter what. And uh, if you can give that to someone while they're a kid, you know, mm-hmm. before they make a mistake, I think uh, as humans, we're, we're so like to have a sense of like safety in our body. It's is so dependent on having a sense of belonging mm-hmm. and having a sense of like family. And I think to, to let a kid know that they're accepted and that um, that they're loved no matter what in the, such a tangible way as like really being there to support them and then making their own choices, like nothing can do so much to really set a kid free. I really love what Xander shared. Imagine, from your child's perspective, feeling truly seen and supported for who you are, knowing that you're loved no matter what. How empowering. So, in bringing all these together, it was fascinating to see the threads that repeatedly wove through so many of their answers. Things like releasing control and embracing who your child is the value they found in the freedom to make choices and to be okay with making mistakes, listening to them respectfully and having open conversations without agendas, helping them explore who they are and trusting them to find their way. Those are many of the roots of unschooling. Build that foundation and you'll soon discover how everything else grows from there. Curiosity and lifelong learning, strong and connected relationships, It's amazing. And remember to have fun with it. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.